Farm Progress Broadcast presents This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry. Brought to you by Case IH, solutions for every challenge, equipment for every farm. Case IH, built by farmers. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us here for This Week in Agribusiness. I'm Mike Pearson. As the calendar flipped to October last week, it was a busy week for farmers across the country. In the southeast, growers began the cleanup process after Hurricane Helene, and in other parts of the country, harvest has moved ahead. That's the focus of this week's Agronomy for Your Acres with our friends from Nutrien Ag Solutions. Joining us this week is Dustin Fritzmeyer of Leota, Kansas. Dustin, thanks for taking the time to chat with us. Hey, appreciate you having me today, Mike. So Leota, Kansas, as I recall, you are far western Kansas, basically between Scott City and the Colorado border. Is that right? That's correct. We're out here, uh, out here on the flatlands of Kansas. Well, how is harvest progress moving in your part of the world? Harvest is going great, Mike. Uh, we've got a lot of silage acres wrapped up. Um, right now, we're, we're in the middle of getting some dry land out, some of our irrigated as it's getting ready. And we've got some stuff where moisture content's right where it needs to be and others that it's going to take a couple weeks to get some stuff dried down, but we're right in the heat of it. Yields are looking solid for growers? Yields are looking good. Um, it's, you know, we've got a lot of different rainfall through our few counties out here. And, and so, so things are kind of sporadic, but we've got some some really good uh, dry land corn. I've heard some bushels coming in over that 120, 130 mark um, and a lot of stuff where, you know, rainfall is a little bit short, you know, in that 60 to 80 range. So it's, it's a little bit all over the board. A lot of diversity in that part of the country. Dustin, looks like you might be standing in a field plot. We've got some signs behind you. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've been working on there? Absolutely. Uh, corn plots are something we really like doing. Uh, we we're able to get a good look at different varieties that are coming up throughout the year. So this particular one is on a farmer that's been working with us for the last decade. And uh, we've got some different, uh, four different hybrids from three different companies. And, uh, and just we're ready to get, get through it and get some data pulled off for, uh, for next year coming up. I know, I know you don't have the data yet from the harvest, but uh, how have things looked through the growing season in the plot? Yeah, things have looked great. Um, this this particular field has been one that's caught some beneficial rains. It has been one that uh, that the farmer's done a, a great job of of getting his yield right where he wants to be. And and we're looking we're looking forward to some good yields. Pulled a couple of ears out. I uh, got some 54 VC14 Dynagro, and uh, it's a 114 day product that that we're really looking forward to 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 cover some of our dry land uh, possibly and into our irrigated acres for sure. All right, new options coming for growers. Dustin, let's talk about what comes next year. I'm sure some of your farmers are already looking ahead to that 2025 season. And what are some of the issues on your mind? So this, this time of year is always fun. Um, it's for us, it's seed selling season. And so we're out talking to farmers, you know, hey, what is the game plan for next year? And Mike, it's, we jump on combines and I get a lot of responses of, hey, I don't want to talk about 2025 corn when I haven't even got this, this field completed and I don't even know what I've got for this year. But it's important for us to have those conversations early so that we can get logistically get corn uh, corn on order, get the right seed size, the right hybrid, because if we wait until springtime, oftentimes, you know, we run into uh, supply issues if we don't get those things booked early. And so our seed companies are going to incentivize that by using prepaid discounts. Uh, and we at Nutrien Ag Solutions have really aggressive and competitive financial options that we can use through our nutrient financial uh, programs. So I definitely encourage people, hey, talk to your local crop consultants about, about what those finance options are and, and how those can be a player for you. All right, Dustin, real quick, before we let you go, any other thoughts in, in your mind here as harvest season works through? Absolutely, Mike. Uh, at Nutrien, we, we have safety as one of our core values. And when it comes to fall harvest, we know it's, it's a long season of the year, uh, our fall harvest, and it's one that can be really busy. I want to take a moment and just encourage, encourage anybody who may be partaking in, in fall harvest I take your time this year. Uh, as you're going down the roads, going through intersections, there's still corn there. Uh, keep an eye on the road of what's going on. You know, take that cell phone, put it in the seat next to you. Um, that text message can wait till you get to the elevator or back to the field. Um, it's important to keep our eyes on the road. And, and just as important as, as our physical safety is also our mental safety. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to be a part of a company that has a, an employee helpline to be able to call into if there's, you know, mental issues that we're going through. And I think as farmers, a lot of times we can have this rough and tough uh, mentality that, that I got to pull myself up by my bootstraps. Well, sometimes that's tough to do on our own, 
And so by no means do you have to feel like you've got to do harvest on your own, like you've got to do life on your own. Uh, reach out to somebody. And even if it's your local Nutrient Ag Solutions, they can help point you in the right direction to where, uh, to where some help might be needed. So, you know, agronomy for your acres is important, and we want to keep you as a farmer continuing to gain that agronomy and continuing to, uh, uh, to farm together. Absolutely. Dustin Fritzmeyer, Leota, Kansas, crop consultant with Nutrient Ag Solutions. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Thanks, Mike. And you can learn more at NutrientAgSolutions.com. Save instantly when you buy two or more eligible Firestone Ag tires during the Firestone Fall Into Savings promotion now until October 31st. Visit FirestoneAg.com or contact your local certified ag dealer. It's time to talk markets. Joining us this week is Pedro Deneca. He's a partner at MD Commodities. And Pedro, thanks for speaking with us this week. Absolutely, Mike. Pleasure to be here. Let's dive into these commodity markets right off the bat. Corn was up this week. Pedro, what are you watching here in the corn market as we move deeper into the U.S. harvest season? Absolutely. Well, I think we all know what's happening here. U.S. harvest, it's a plentiful, bountiful harvest. Now, you know, we're going to have some minor adjustments, not only here in the October report uh, next week on the 11th, but, you know, also primarily in the January report. But at the end of the day, the soybean crop and the corn crop in the U.S. are outstanding this year. Um, so congratulations to the U.S. producer. Uh, if it wasn't for the reduction in area that we had this year in the U.S., uh, U.S. was going to harvest another record corn crop, and they are setting new records in yields. So this was the year. We told our Brazilian clients throughout the season, this is very likely the year that the U.S. producer is going to test uh, the yield potential, and that's exactly what happened. Again, not perfect weather, but it was very, very good. So, but I think this time of year, Mike, many people get lost a little bit, right? Because we've seen a very nice bounce from the uh, mid-August lows. And then there's a lot of guys that get caught up. Oh, you know, things have changed. No, nothing has changed. We have oversupply of corn in the world. We have oversupply of soybeans in the world. Um, but the markets don't always have to trade fundamentals. And that's a good thing. This technical bounce, this relief bounce is healthy. It was necessary. Uh, and, uh, but we also have to keep in mind what's behind the curtain, if you will. Absolutely. So, Pedro, with that being the case, with much lower prices than we were seeing this time last year, what's your advice to your Brazilian clients on corn for this next season? Do you expect to see an increase in acres down there in Brazil? So a little bit early, Mike, you know, a lot of people like to talk about safrinha. Just a reminder, safrinha planting doesn't really happen until later part of February, March uh, in earnest, right? That's when things really get going. So, um, and, and also, the, the, the farmer always likes to say, oh, if, if I don't have the perfect one to plant safrinha corn, I'm not going to plant it. That's all talk. Uh, farmers farm, they want to plant, they're going to plant corn. I, I think we could count on steady area, maybe a little bit of growth, but nothing, you know, nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, as long as weather is good, I think Brazil could come back with another strong crop north of uh, 125, 130 million metric tons. Uh, we had a record crop two years ago of 137. This past year was closer to 120. Uh, but I, I believe Brazil is here in the game for corn. They're going to compete for exports uh, you know, for the foreseeable future. Uh, also, uh, Brazil was the leader in corn exports last year with 58 million metric tons. And this past year, uh, this year now, we're going to go down to maybe 35 millimetric tons with the U.S. regaining the number one position and Argentina right there in the fight for uh, second place. So the corn market has stout competition between U.S., Argentina and Brazil for exports. That's not even to mention the Black Sea, which can also export a decent amount. So uh, despite everything that's happening over there. So we tell our clients, listen, if the corn market is giving you margins, if you have opportunities, at the very, very least, you have to lock in your costs, right? You have to cover your costs. Uh, and if you want to speculate, if you want to hold to see if something better happens down the road, fine. But at least lock in your costs. That's right. Manage that risk while you've got the opportunity. When we come yes, back, sir. we're going to talk soybeans with Pedro. So leave it here for more This Week in Agribusiness. Save instantly when you buy two or more eligible Firestone Ag tires during the Firestone Fall Into Savings promotion now until October 31st. Visit FirestoneAg.com or contact your local certified ag dealer. We're talking markets this week with Pedro Deneca of MD Commodities. Pedro, thanks for speaking with us.
Absolutely. Always a pleasure, Mike. Let's talk about soybeans. A lot of ink has been spilled here in America over the past several weeks about the current dryness in Brazil as they head into planting season. Pedro, put this into perspective for us. How much of a market impact should this dryness have? Mike, different year, same mistake. Uh, you know, it's incredible. People don't learn. Uh, we should never talk about planting pace in Brazil until mid-October at the earliest. Uh, the, the rains arrive seasonally uh, for the heart of the belt in Brazil, which is the Cerrado that we call it, Mato Grosso, etc., uh, usually around mid-October. And also a, a little factoid that it's very, very important. Around 70% of soybeans in Brazil are planted between October 10th and November 25th. Uh, Argentina's planting window is even later. So again, uh, the market likes to get excited. I think you know the market always wants something to trade. The market they want something to talk about. And uh, since we know the U.S. crop is is going to be a giant crop, uh, and I, we don't know the exact number, but we're looking at record yields and a, a potentially record crop in soybeans. The market is looking for the next story, and so they start in September talking about Brazilian weather when it's not really relevant. Uh, the guys they usually plant in September are the guys that are going to plant cotton right behind soybeans. Uh, but that's a very, very small percentage of the total soybean area, right? And, and also that window extends until October 10th, October 15th, but again, very, very small percentage. So again, uh, as long as the rains arrive, as the maps are showing right now, uh, they're arriving seasonally and in nice volume and coverage around October 10th, 11th, 12th, we're... We're off to a great start in Brazil. All right, so we will see those beans going in the ground down there south of the equator. Pedro, looking at the soybean market globally, there were a couple of pops and drops in meal and oil this week, largely, I've been told, related to an EU law. Can you give us some background on what happens in the product market this week? Absolutely. So the product market, actually, we wrote a, we, we write a, a weekly report to our clients in Brazil, and that was the, uh, uh, the main feature in, in yesterday's report uh, for this week. Uh, the product market is dominating the, the soybean market. The soybean market has been able to hold steady here somewhere close to, if you use the November contract, 1060, 1050, 1070. Uh, we use the March contract down in Brazil, close to $11. But again, that's a function of what has been happening last week. It was the oil popping on that whole situation with the used cooking oil, right? Potentially blocking the entrance of used cooking oil here in the US. Um, and then now this week is that's the, the meal story. And meal was rallying nicely until yesterday we had the headline coming out of Europe uh, right around probably 3 a.m. Chicago, right when the day in Europe started, uh, talking about a potential postponement of the law that prevents anything that was planted and harvested in uh, defore uh, deforestation land, I guess, in deforestation area. Uh, that was going to go, uh, it was going to be to, to execute starting December 24. Apparently now there's a 12 month postponement. So there was a lot of uh, meal buyers in Europe that were anticipating those purchases, uh, trying to get ahead of that December 24th date. And now with this potential postponement, I hear it's very likely to happen. Uh, the meal market relaxed. As a matter of fact, the meal market yesterday, Mike, lost 5% from 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. And that's what took uh, beans down with it in the beginning of the day yesterday due to that exact headline. Wow. Lots to watch here in these markets as the winter gets closer. Pedro Deneca, MD Commodities, thank you so much for sharing your insight this week. Absolutely, sir. Greg Solier now brings us his farm weather forecast for the week ahead. Well, let's dig into that weather with meteorologist Greg Solier and Greg Pacific Northwest. What are you watching up there this week? Well, really signs of a pattern shift, pattern change later in the week. Otherwise, it's all ahead forward on fall field work. Yeah, a little more rain would be appreciated. And we've had some spells over the past couple of weeks of some heat through Washington State, more so through Big Sky Country and the Dakotas. But over the past week, uh, quite the opposite reversal with an early fall field, a little whimper of frost in some locales, but not unusual for the late September early October calendar date. So early in the week, not much going on. Little boundaries here across the northern Rockies. Cool, dry air across the Dakotas. Later in the week, the vanguard, the start to a pattern shift in the northwestern part of the country. Trophiness, as you would expect for this point in early autumn, and significant moisture getting going will uh, certainly be appreciated in those wetter wheat fields. On the front side of that, you build the ridge on northward, and here comes another surge of a late season wind-blown uh, warmth and heat across the uh, spring grain areas of the Dakotas, 
beans, what's left them out there it will be into mature mode and harvest mode. That'll be ongoing. So it's pretty much as you would expect for uh, autumn across the Pacific Northwest. Moisture in store here and a late summer push of uh, warm, dry air into the northern and central plains. Quiet across the southwest. Monsoon season has wound on down. We've certainly have had some heat through the valleys of uh, California and a warmth as well ahead of this weak cold front with maybe a stray shower thunderstorm into parts of uh, Texas. Those winter wheat fields need moisture. Don't see much of it at all this week with another push of 85 to 95 degree midsummer like air as far north as Nebraska across Oklahoma and Texas heat across the southwestern states and here's the front side of uh, the southern reflection of that trough moving through parts of northern and central California with a drop in temperatures most of the moisture again situated to the north. Will the northern corn belt experience that summer part two as well? Yeah part two or three or four however you want to label it here uh, certainly uh, expectations of some encore uh, summertime weather after the coolness of the past week to 10 days a couple of scattered frost pockets noted in through the northern plains and upper midwest as you would expect weak frontal boundary and the move has a sprinkle with it down towards the ohio valley things have firmed up there coming off uh, helene's moisture uh, over the past uh, 10 days or so and look at this high pressure across the midwest wind blown and warmer to hotter weather across areas of the western corn belt back in the plains probably pushing 90 into the missouri valley so opportunities for outdoor work continue on as well as uh, field work those combines will be rolling low afternoon humidity good moisture reduction and dry down values will continue there till further notice a little lingering heat into the Rio Grande and some tropical rains on sort of a hybrid system it'll encounter some wind shear with some strengthening winds up a lot but still more rain back in the forecast for the eastern Gulf Coast and parts of Florida otherwise from the southern plains to the Ohio Valley late season warmth heat back into Texas as well as the southwestern reaches of the country scattered showers and thunderstorms with lingering midsummer humidity along the Gulf Coast take us all the way to the east. Greg, what do you see? Uh, overall, pretty quiet, uneventful weather picture here. Weak uh, cool front on the move. Couple of showers. Note the dry time through the western corn belt. Wide and expansive high pressure and control. Lots of uh, early autumn sunshine. Coolness through the northern parts of New England. Heat building across the western corn belt locales. Southeastern states clean up and recovery across the damaged areas of Helene. Here's this hybrid tropical system across the Gulf of Mexico. Widespread showers and thunderstorms there. Meanwhile, from the Tennessee Valley back into the southern plains, back to warmer, drier, and hotter weather as the week wears on. Closed captioning for this week in agribusiness is brought to you by Pentair Hypro, a global leader in innovative spray technology for farmers for over 75 years. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness. Now, it's been just over a week since Hurricane Helene made landfall in North Florida and moved her way up the eastern seaboard, causing billions of dollars in damages. Heading into the weekend, authorities report nearly 200 people have been killed so far, and rescuers are still working trying to identify and find further missing people. Crops were damaged all along the route. Cattle producers, of course, throughout the Appalachian Valleys are still trying to locate their animals. As the storm moved north and brought rain over drought-impacted crops in the eastern Corn Belt, now those crops are starting to sprout in the fields. Farther south, poultry producers took a devastating hit across Georgia and throughout the southeast, cotton harvest was imminent. Bowls were open and damage is being calculated as we speak. Joining me now to discuss the issue is Dr. Gary Adams. He's the president and CEO of the National Cotton Council. And Dr. Adams, thanks for joining us this week. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Let's talk about the impact on cotton production here from Hurricane Helene. Why was the impact so profound this year? Well, I, I think one, we have to keep in mind that it came pretty much straight up through Georgia, which is the second largest cotton producing state uh, in an average year. Georgia is going to produce about 2 million bales out of roughly a 15 million bale U.S. crop. So it came across a lot of acres. And then we also have to consider the timing of which the hurricane came in, uh, came across Georgia. A lot of those fields were just ready for harvest, which means the bowls were open, uh, susceptible to damage. And and that's what we've heard as we begin talking to our growers over the last week. Gary, for those of us who are not in cotton production, unfamiliar with the crop in the field, can you describe what happens when those bowls open and why it's catastrophic? Yeah, and really, as as producers prepare for harvest, they, they do have a... a an application they apply to the fields that will open up those bowls. And that's when you ride by and see the fluffy white cotton uh, that looks so pretty from the uh, from the road. Now, 
the problem is, and, and of course it's ready to be picked and goes through and the picker uh, pulls those pulls the fiber out of the bowls. The problem is when you get heavy wind and rainfall, then that's also going to pull uh, the fiber out and really it's going to leave it strung out or on the ground. And so that's why it's so devastating is because the wind and rain can really uh, do a lot of damage to the fiber and pull it out and leave it on the ground and leave nothing for the, for the farmer left to pick. So fill us in on how producers are handling the aftermath. Dr. Adams, are we going to start to see harvest move forward? Do they need time to, to recalibrate? What happens here for the producer? And, and you're, you're right. I mean, it, it's right now they're still assessing the damage. I mean, some of the impacts that we heard were, you know, producers were still trying to uh, to remove trees so they could get it out of their driveway and really see what the damage is in their fields. Now, we've seen some pictures and we know that there's been some extensive damage, particularly in the eastern half of Georgia. And some producers are going to probably see fields that are, are basically a total loss, but they will get in and assess what is, can be harvested and what fields are not going to be harvested. Uh, and, and that's the process they're going through right now. And some of that is still too early to say, and it will depend on weather going forward. You know, do, do some of those plants stand back up that might have been pushed down by the wind? Uh, is there still a crop there to harvest? So yes, that's where producers are right now, still assessing the damage. How are producers economically faring as we go forward? I imagine most of the cotton produced in this country is covered by some form of crop insurance. Well, we do we do have uh, some crop insurance. Most of the time that that coverage is going to be probably at a 70 or 75 percent level. Some might have a little bit higher level, which that really means that you've got a, a 20 or 25 percent deductible, if we want to think about it that way, that's not going to be compensated. And unfortunately for producers, particularly this year, and even, even before the hurricane, and, and for those producers not affected by the hurricane, market prices have weakened as we've gone through 2024. And we look at a futures market that today sits well below cost of production. And unfortunately, some of the support levels in, our, uh, in, the, in the current farm bill are below cost of production, as those costs have really risen over the last several years. So what we were already looking at in terms of a very difficult economic situation where producers were already, even with a normal crop, likely to lose money. Now you're just going to exacerbate that for those producers that on top of the economic losses have to uh, put in uh, production loss as well. Now I understand it's not just the supply that's been impacted. It's also demand. Textile manufacturing facilities were shut down as well. Is that right? Uh, that's correct, and and we still have a textile manufacturing industry that's in uh, northeast Georgia. You're going to have it in western North Carolina, some in South Carolina, and some in eastern Tennessee. And particularly as we look at some of the rainfall totals that occurred, in, and a lot of that's going to be some of those areas that are a little bit more hilly, prone to flooding. And that's some of the issues that we're dealing with on the textile side is some facilities that are that are flooded, some that are still without power, and it has those shut down as well. So unfortunately, with we've had impacts on production, we've had impacts kind of up the supply chain with buildings being damaged. And then as we look at the demand side and our U.S. textile manufacturers, some of those have been hit extremely hard by uh, the heavy rainfall. Dr. Adams, before we let you go, in addition to demand, we've also got the port strike. Is that going to have a, an impact on cotton prices, do you think? I think it lo the longer it goes, it can have a, a, a detrimental impact on prices, uh, particularly if we cannot get the, the cotton exported. Uh, eastern ports, Gulf ports are very important for cotton exports, particularly if you look at ports such as Savannah, Charleston, Norfolk, Houston, Galveston. All of those are key ports for cotton uh, products to move out, not just the raw fiber exports, but also the yarn and fabric that our textile manufacturers produce. Dr. Gary Adams, President and CEO of the National Cotton Council, thank you so much for joining us this week. Farm Progress Broadcast presents This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry. Brought to you by Case IH, solutions for every challenge, equipment for every farm. Case IH, built by farmers. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness. I'm Mike Pearson. Max Armstrong has been on the road a lot this late summer, talking to growers about how things look in their fields. Recently, he had the chance to visit Osborne, Missouri, and he talked with Chris Curtis for this week's Plan Smart, Grow Smart series from BASF.
What do you think the prospects are for this 2024 crop? We're still looking good. Our early planted corn that we got in looks really strong. The last two or three years, we've raised some really good corn if it got planted. And uh, of course, we had that six week break. Our late corn is we're right at fungicide time right now. And uh, it's very crucial. We're getting borderline dry. We've had some heat. I understand you've uh, had the best corn crop to date last year on your operation. What role did fungicides play in that? Very high. We fungicided almost every acre of corn. It has been a trend for us. You know, we kind of started with it at a quarter, then half and two thirds. And we're, we're doing about 100% of our ground uh, every year on the corn and uh, grain fill is very, very large. You want to have dry grain and a green plant. Veltima for us has been very important in getting that accomplished. Uh, how do you really assess your return on investment here? With the fungicides, you know, sometimes it doesn't show up strictly on yield. You can study yield maps till you're blue in the face, but another huge reason we use this is for standability. You've got to have a standing crop. You're wanting to protect what's there compared to sometimes adding what's there. So many discussions we have with growers, they're talking about tar spot and the pressures that tar spot is bringing. How prevalent has it been in your area? I mean, we're finding it in some fields in the lower ear leaves and uh, we're fortunate. You got to protect these plants. You know, I try to treat these plants like you take care of a newborn baby. You got to take care of it. You know, you got to keep this plant going. We feel that Veltima is going to help us do that. As far as the actual tar spot, we haven't had tar spot really, you know, decline our yields around here. Last year when it came in, it was after the corn was already denting and uh, we lucked out. Corn is king and if you want to take care of it, you're going to have to have to treat it. Thank you, Max. And folks, you can see our full series online at plantsmartgrowsmart.com. Greg Sodia is back now with his extended farm weather forecast for the nation. Earlier in the program, Greg outlined the weather risks in the week ahead, and it looks like the eastern seaboard might get more moisture, Greg. Yeah, mid-Atlantic region, southeastern states again, same areas, parts of the eastern Tennessee Valley into the central and southern Appalachians, western North Carolina, and uh, points on southward on the northern flank of some kind of wind shear tropical systems. We'll see what materializes. Winds are going to be much stronger up aloft, so we don't see the uh, you know assessment and damage and uh, conditions that we had with Helene, but one more drop of rain puts you over the edge, and here it is over the southeastern part of the country, roughly from the Ohio back westward to the divide and northward. Nothing going on in the moisture department. It's that time of the year where we put the rain snow line higher peaks there through the Wasatch and uh, maybe uh, the Cascades. Northern Rockies could see some moisture and late in the week. Significant moisture, Mike, in the forecast for the Pacific Northwest. Those winter wheat fields will appreciate it. Absolutely, Greg. What do you see for the week of October 14th? There's absolutely nothing with regard to a typical, normal, long lasting fall weather pattern here. Those winds are coming down the Rockies. We build up upper level high pressure as well. And this is almost a midsummer like air mass situated across the Great Plains, warmth all the way up into the Great Lakes region, Ohio Valley across the southeastern part of the country. It's back to normal on temperatures here and the warmth all the way into the valleys of California. This warmth, by the way, with low dew points, low afternoon humidity. So if you're out there in the combine uh, part of life harvest, uh, boy, things will be drying out quite nicely here in the days and weeks to come. Below average moisture for the Corn Belt back through California, normal for the Pacific Northwest, the only corridor of significant significant moisture. Well, it's the haves versus have nots and too much of a good thing still in the southeastern part of the country. Do you see any changes in the pattern as we get towards the week of October 21st? Nothing substantial. We continue on. That's just remember safety first. No, no need to really push it. Remember, we'll get it done uh, earlier and more often this year, I think, with harvest in mind across the Corn Belt. Much above probably some near record warmth, at least maybe pushing 80 in some locales as far north as the central Corn Belt. Normal temperatures here, warmth over the southern plains. We do see a little dip in the jet, so readings are uh, trending a bit below average across sections of the west and north. Northwest, where significant moisture comes into play. Back through areas of big sky country as well. Ongoing harvest operations, but again, a double edged sword because we're worsening dryness and drought as well into this particular part of the country. Tropics still busy here as we wind our way in the waning days of October for the mid Atlantic, southeastern states, and some tropical moisture too into those fields across Texas. Does it start to feel like fall, Greg, as we get into November? Nothing like it. I think we may be looking at one of these years where we just completely bypass autumn and move right into wintertime. That's what we're 
we're thinking here down the line later in November and December. Coolness for the northeast of New England, the hot ridge of steel across the middle part of the country to the western states. Normal temperatures over the southeast in the tropics stay busy again. Gulf Coast and through Florida, maybe a name system here, maybe another one through the western Atlantic and up and down the eastern seaboard. Widespread moisture is anticipated up through the Canadian Prairie. Opportunities for outdoor work and harvest to wrap it up, maybe from the Corn Belt and westward. Our Farm Progress Roundup is sponsored by Brant Industries. Lead the field with Brant's lineup of versatile high-speed discs and achieve better results with every pass. Visit brant.ca to learn more. The World Dairy Expo kicked off in Madison, Wisconsin this past week, and the Farm Progress Livestock team was on hand to talk to the folks there in Madison. Joining us now to discuss it is Sarah Muirhead. She serves as the Managing Director for Livestock here at Farm Progress, and Sarah, thanks for filling us in. Thanks for having me, Mike. World Dairy Expo, how were the crowds this year? What was the overall attitude of the attendees you spoke with? Crowds have been really good and the attitudes have been awesome because it's just a lot of positive energy going on in the industry. We're seeing some profitability. We're seeing some strong export markets. So a lot of good things and it's making people pretty happy. Now, of course, at Feedstuffs 365, you'll have a lot of the interviews you've been conducting there at the World Dairy Expo. On that market front, Sarah, does it sound like these prices could have legs into the future for dairy producers? It does. Yes, there's a lot of positive energy. We've talked to um, a number of analysts and they're all saying that 2025 looks to be a, a much better year for the dairy industry. We're seeing still a lot of, you know, um, the fluid milk is always a challenge in terms of are we going to be able to have that to fuel some of the uh, more, you know, the needs for cheese and other further processed products. But uh, that's a good problem to have if you, you know, you've got the demand, right? Absolutely. And that demand is a really interesting part of the dairy equation, as I understand it right now, Sarah. There seems to be a push inside the industry to bring more full fat dairy products out to consumers. Was that under discussion in Madison this week? We did. We talked with the folks, uh, actually a dairy producer, a director of the uh, DMI, and he was talking to us about a collaboration they're doing at Mayo Clinic, and that is to educate um, doctors and healthcare professionals about the value of full fat dairy in diets. Also, they're focusing on the very young, um, you know, the infants and the importance of, of fat in those diets. So that also has opportunities for the dairy industry moving forward. So education at that level to then push that down to consumers. And that's where a lot of the focus is. And that is the health and wellness. That's always a, a neat thing to see. And as dairy is being a part of that is even better. Absolutely. The most complete food dairy producers call their own product there. Sarah, mm -hmm. sustainability is a hot topic. Was it up for discussion this week? Sustainability continues to be a hot topic. Um, and it's been interesting to see because the discussions we've had, people are like, profitability comes first and then sustainability. You can have profitability. Um, and sustainability, but let's focus first on that profitability part of the equation. So a lot of discussion about how we can achieve both, but also maintaining and not hurting the bottom line in that process. Lots to watch in this dairy industry. It has been a big shift from earlier this spring price wise. Sarah, if we've got audience members who want to watch the interviews that you did, where would you recommend they go? They can just go to feedstuffs.com, click on the, there's a dairy expo um, box on the homepage, and you can get all of the interviews there. Fantastic. Sarah Muirhead, Managing Director of Livestock at Farm Progress. Thanks for joining us this week. Thank you, Mike. Next on This Week in Agribusiness, it's Max's Tractor Shed, where we spotlight another great American farm tractor. In Max's Tractor Shed this weekend, it's an orchard tractor, a rather unusual one. It's believed to be the only one in existence today of this particular model. It's at the American Tractor Museum in Missouri. Max's Tractor Shed is brought to you by Mystic Lubricants. Mystic Lubricants are made to make it last. Well, there were several companies that made co-op tractors. Now, this is a number one orchard tractor, co-op orchard tractor, made in 1933, and it was made in Battle Creek, Michigan. This tractor was made for the Cooperative Manufacturing Company. Now, there, there was the Farmers Union Central 
co-op tractors. There was the National Farm Machinery Cooperatives co-op tractors. This particular tractor apparently utilized a truck rear end and had a four-cylinder gas Waukesha engine. And you can see it yourself up close and personal at the American Tractor Museum right there in Perryville, Missouri. Yes, you've heard me talk about it in the past. It's such a great destination. It's only about an hour and a half or so south of St. Louis down Interstate 55. They are open Monday through Friday and on certain Saturdays they have limited hours. Check out their schedule and everything else there at the website americantractormuseum.com. They're also on Facebook, American Tractor Museum. americantractormuseum.com. Tell them Max sent you. Oh, and tell Mark Stockway sent you. Here's his report now from Big Iron Auctions. Well, hello, Max, with Harvest in full swing. Remember, you can bid on BigIron.com from the convenience of your smartphone or your mobile device. And participating in an auction on October 9th is easier than ever before. With over 1,100 items to choose from, one of the featured sellers on our October 9th sale is Taylor Implement Inc. from Greeley, Colorado, selling 85 high-quality pieces of equipment. 2022 year model Klaus Lexion 7500 TT combines and Klaus Jaguar 960 Forge harvesters. Also, Alden Boyd is from Lake Preston, South Dakota. They'll sell 60 items on the sale October the 9th. And Max Big Iron Realty and Sullivan Auctioneers Land Company are selling land all across the country. On October the 10th, 125 acres of Montgomery County, Illinois land will sell in two tracks. 552 acres of Weld County, Colorado land will sell in two different tracks. And 39 acres of Peoria County, Illinois land will sell on Friday, October the 11th. And finally, Max, on October 14th and 15th, please be watching the Jack Lukeman Collector Car Retirement Auction. His collection, located in Jacksonville, Illinois, will sell to the highest bidder with over 530 items each day. This is a very big sale. Check it all out on BigIron.com. Our FFA Chapter Tribute is brought to you by Pioneer, developing new generations of seed innovations for new generations of farmers. Pioneer, what's next happens here. And this week, we're getting to know Tennessee FFA's State Secretary, Shelby Wallace. Shelby, thanks for joining us this week. Thank you for having me. Now, of course, Tennessee has been in the news over the past week, as uh, many in your state are dealing with the ramifications of Hurricane Helene. Is that something the FFA has gotten involved with in providing assistance? Yes, sir. So actually, the Tennessee FFA Foundation is taking donations. We can go to their website, their social medias to find out how to do donate. But they're trying to help out East Tennessee, mainly through gift cards. Tennessee FFA is trying to get together some maybe some labor. We have some state officers in East Tennessee that attend UT Knoxville. And so maybe they're trying to come in and help them out with more labor kind of things. So yes, we do have a plan to help out our members in East Tennessee. We are keeping them in our, in our thoughts and prayers, uh, I know they were devastated. There are some chapters over there that were devastated. We're actually doing some chapter visits in East Tennessee. We actually have one in uh, Irwin next week or in the coming weeks. And so we plan on helping them a lot because we know that they were highly devastated. Absolutely. FFA or stick together, not afraid of a little hard work, which is going to be needed after this storm. Let's talk a little bit about you, Shelby McEwen, Tennessee, where you grew up. What type of agriculture is, uh, is around that vicinity? Well, McEwen, Tennessee is a very small town. It's very rural, about a thousand people, and there's no stoplight. So, so very rural, everybody knows everybody. And the agriculture that I grew up around was really cattle calf. Uh, and so I grew up on a livestock production, but there are some row crop farmers. There are some soybeans, our number one commodity in the state, but I grew up around that livestock aspect. And so that's the industry that I really grew to appreciate, although all are important, I grew to appreciate the livestock industry because that's what my family does. Uh, but we also have a few dairies. We also have some row crops and so some corn. So we have a little bit of everything. But for me, I was particularly specialized within the livestock side of things. Well, Shelby, we wish you and the Tennessee FFA the best as you go forward. And thanks for spending the time with us this week. Yeah, thank you so much.
Colby Ag Tech is brought to you by PTX, a new brand from Agco that includes precision ag technologies from Precision Planting and PTX Trimble. Yes, Chad Colby's been out on the road as well this past week, talking to growers in advance of harvest. And let's see what sort of new technologies he's found for us this week. Well, just like computers, you can add some great new technology to maybe an older dryer system. Matt, talk about some new innovation you brought to your grain dryer this year. Yeah, so just like computers or iPhones, they wear out over time. This one was 12 years old, it was time to update. So we have a new controller, the Intua Dry uh, system from Brock on the, on the dryer that I already have. Matt, it looked like you didn't have to change your cabinet either. It looked like they just replaced everything on the inside. Yeah, the box is the same. Everything inside is different inside the uh, circuit boards. And then inside the dryer shed, I also have an in, a new display, much more user friendly than the old one. So you, you have the over, overview screen. And as this is running, there will be animation, the auger turning, the unload turning, the fan blowing, and the burner lit. Um, and then once you want to drill into the systems, you can, you can change the delay for the, the loading system. Uh, you can go back. You can, uh, you got all the different controls for burner, uh, as far as set points, uh, stuff like that. From this uh, page, I can also change the burner temp if I want to run 200 degrees. I can set my moisture target and the speed at which I'm unloading if I'm in manual control. Matt, I assume this controller then can be run remotely with a phone or iPad? Yes, so the system is capable of running remotely on an app on your phone. You just have to have Wi-Fi on the site, and that is a goal for next year is to add Wi-Fi via Starlink or another provider to the location. Well, one thing's for sure, it's great to see some new updates to maybe even an old dryer that can work well on anybody's farm. For This Week in Agribusiness, I'm Chad Colby. Thank you, Chad. And folks, stick around. When This Week in Agribusiness comes back, we'll talk corn harvest in Illinois. Our friends at Pioneer have been keeping an eye on what's happening between the rows on farm fields across the country. And recently, I spoke with agronomist Andy Knepp about how harvest is moving along in central Illinois. The early yields that we've seen so far in this part of the country have just been um, you know, maybe some folks don't want to hear this, but they've just been nothing but phenomenal. Um, probably what I would say locally here, fairly, fairly close, if not above record yields. But observations are um, good, good uh, kernel counts, good ear counts. Uh, we've actually had pretty good filling weather. Uh, so my expectations are that that, that grain uh, yield is going to be pretty good, too. All right, Andy, even when you're in a garden spot, growers still encounter challenges. What were some of the trouble spots that your farmers hit this season? The things that we deal with on on an annual basis, uh, really around insect pests, right? We we always are concerned about uh, rootworm. We're concerned about the 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 above ground pests like corn borer, uh, like earworm, and so you know those are those are sort of the perennial issues that we always have to be thinking about dealing with. Well, let's talk about what's coming from Pioneer to help growers address some of these challenges. Andy, what are you excited about? Yeah, so uh, what's new from us uh, this year? Uh, a new trait platform, Power Core Enlist. Uh, we're really excited about it uh, because it's it's providing us uh, a lot of um, you know improved control of, of these insects that I talked about earlier. At least the above ground insects. Uh, we've got three modes of action for uh, for those above ground insect pests. Um, you know that that comes also with a uh, with a new uh, herbicide resistance platform. So you heard me say Power Core Enlist. We have Enlist tolerance uh, now on this, which gives us a a wider window of application for controlling some of those tough to control broadleaf weeds. Water hemp is a perennial issue for us in both our corn and soybeans. So having another tool in the toolbox that gives us an ability to control that weed is always going to be welcome. Um, and the great thing about uh, this power corn list, it, it comes on our, our, our elite pioneer genetics. So we see a, about a, a nine bushel advantage over our, our competitive checks. Uh, and so we're really unlocking that, uh, that genetic potential on that field by protecting the, the yield robbing insects, the yield robbing weeds, uh, and really allowing those genetics to, to maximize what they can do. Andy, given the advantages that these genetics are bringing to corn production, what fields are you going to be targeting first to put the power core and list into next year? Yeah, so um, for, for us, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of not necessarily a targeted approach. Um, we fight water hemp on every field. 
Uh, and again, having that uh, improved flexibility from a weed control perspective to have more tools in our toolbox uh, is really important for us. Uh, and so that, that's really something that I think is going to have a fit on every acre. Uh, obviously, where we have corn on corn acres, we're going to be looking at a product like Boar Seed and List, which is going to bring, uh, you know, below ground control as well. Um, again, with all those other wonderful attributes. Um, but we're really looking at uh, products that fit a broad number of acres uh, and where you're really trying to control those above ground pests. Power Core Ultra, uh, Power Core Enlist are going to be uh, great products for you. Andy, before we let you go, any harvest predictions here for Central Illinois? Yeah, so the harvest prediction at this moment, um, again, early results on both corn and soybeans are just phenomenally good yields. Um, the, the hard part about that prediction is just really trying to understand uh, how does this late planted crop finish out and, and is it going to be as good as early planted? Indications are it's going to be good. Um, it's just a question of is it going to be better or is it going to be slightly worse? But even at slightly worse, it's still going to be a really good crop. Well, we'll know that answer in just a few weeks. Andy Nepp, Pioneer Field Agronomist, thank you so much for joining us this week. Thank you. Well, and we'll be watching on Monday afternoon when the USDA releases their crop progress report. The trade will be keyed in to see just how far along harvest has moved over the past week. We'll keep an eye on it and bring you those details next time. We appreciate you joining us today, folks. Do be sure to catch us next time right here for This Week in Agribusiness. Take care, everyone. This Week in Agribusiness has been brought to you by Case IH. Solutions for every challenge. Equipment for every farm. Case IH, built by farmers. This Week in Agribusiness is produced by 22 Creative Group and has been a presentation of Farm Progress Broadcast. We invite you to visit us online at agbizweek.com.